back to another episode of All About the Gear. This is a pretty special show because both Doug and I have had a chance to get some hands-on time, Doug more so than I because he owns a thing, um, with this, this new camera from Sony. This thing has stirred up quite a bit of excitement in the mirrorless world because it is the first autofocus full-frame mirrorless camera that's uh, that's available and this of course we're talking about the Sony a7 and the a7r so Doug Doug actually went through and purchased the a7 which I guess would say something off the top about his uh, his uh, affinity for this particular body but uh, we're gonna dive into some of the nuts and bolts of this camera and figure out who it's for why it's good where it falls down and all that good stuff so Doug K the A7, huh? You're, are you, uh, you still on the honeymoon, or is yeah. <laughs> your divorce proceedings started yet? What's going no, on? no, I, we're, we're, we're getting along pretty well. But I, <laughs> I, I, I have to admit, out of the, out of the shoot, that I started out as a fanboy. This is a camera that, when I first heard about it, when I first heard the rumors about it, I said I wanted to own. I, I previously have owned an NEX6 and, and an NEX7, which I had a mostly love, partially hate relationship with. But I really wanted to see what a full-frame Sony could do. Oh, I should say, one of my favorite sh cameras that we reviewed on this show is the Sony RX1R, which is a full-frame, non-interchangeable lens camera. I absolutely love the image quality from that. And I said, boy, if this had interchangeable lenses, I would buy that camera, and I did. Yes, you did. I remember that. I remember yeah. that. And you were slash are a fanboy. You like, And I classify fanboy is, as... Irrational exuberance. <laughs> <laughs> you were irrationally exuberant about this body when it first showed up, right? Yeah, and and the, the good news is that now I've had it for a couple of weeks. We're going to be able to talk about the flaws because uh, as much as I am in love with it, you know, no marriage is perfect. So we're going to be able to dig into that. Just don't tell my wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Well, before you get in trouble, let's talk about the camera. So. All right. What's right. uh, what's give us the overview? What's the what's the, give us the sort of top down bird's eye view of what this camera is, how much it costs, all that good stuff. All right. Well, like you said, it is now the smallest, the lightest uh, autofocusing full frame mirrorless camera. Um, that may not sound like much when you put all those qualifiers in there, but it's a remarkable piece of engineering. Yeah. Twenty four megapixel sensor. Um, if you put on some of the lenses from the NEX. Um, uh, cameras, you automatically go into crop mode. You can disable that, but that'll give you a 10 megapixel camera in crop mode. Mm -hmm. uh, this camera is $1,700 for the body alone, mm -hmm. uh, or $2,000 with the kit lens. Um, it has phase detection added to the automatic uh, to the autofocus sensor, which is a uh, you know becoming more and more common with some of the mirrorless cameras. Um, there is no built-in image stabilization in the body, and in fact, the hmm. prime lenses for it do not have image stabilization either. Huh, um, that's curious. Uh, Sony, Sony's, they're pretty good at image stabilization. I wonder why they left it out of this particular body. Well, yeah, they have it. Uh, they have it in their, you know, the A7. Sorry, the A7. The uh, the A99 cameras. I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they have it there, um, but this camera does not have that uh, in the body. Okay. Uh, they like like the NEX series. They're depending on having it uh, in the lenses. Okay. But that's the basic rundown on it. There's. I should also mention that the A7R. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But that's uh, somewhat more expensive. Twenty three hundred dollars for the body. Uh, it's a thirty six megapixel sensor. Very comparable to the wow. Nikon D eight hundred E. Yeah. Uh, and um, we'll talk about that a bit. So okay. So when I when I had got my hands on this camera and played with it, I played with it for uh, just about almost a full week, and. My initial impression was, wow, you know, look at this. This is this feels like history because it's like, not history. It feels like you know the next big thing in terms of photography because, like you said, it's a full frame, autofocus, interchangeable lens camera. It's the first one of its kind, so I'm feeling it. Um, but coming from other my the other Sony camera that I own is the NEX 5R, which has a touch screen on the LCD. So first thing I did, of course, was try to touch the screen on this thing, and what happened, Doug? What happened yeah, when I tried to touch it? You know, th this is in the category of what's up with that. What's up right? with that? You know, and, uh, you know, we keep saying this about Sony. Uh, they're not getting it right on all their cameras. Of course, it has the articulating display, which is great. We've learned to like that. Yeah. Uh, on, we, on one axis, not, not forward. Right. 
Right. But we've we've also discovered that you can use the remote app to do your selfies, right? Correct. You can you can you, you can't flip it up so you can see it from the front, but the uh, selfie mode works pretty well. Yeah. The um, uh, but as we've said over and over again, you keep going into the menu system and you want to touch stuff and you touch stuff and nothing happens and you say why not? Well, they yeah. just don't. I don't have an answer for you. I can't tell you why, but it doesn't. Um, but the LCD is really good. The menuing system is excellent. Luckily, it does not have the NEX menus, which are just the worst things in the world. They've got the Alpha Series menuing system, which is much better. Mm -hmm. uh, the electronic viewfinder is gorgeous. I mean, I think it's it's the best electronic viewfinder I've ever used on a camera. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I can't quantify that. I can't prove it, and maybe that's fanboy showing through, but I really <laughs> like this electronic viewfinder. I thought it was great. Okay. Cool. All right. So electronic viewfinder. So I'm thinking, just talking about that LCD or the lack of touch on that, maybe they just wanted to leave an open for the next version. So <laughs> the next version, hey, now with touch. You know? Yeah. Who knows? Well, uh, you, know, they, you know, they're not as good as Fuji when it comes to listening to feedback, but they're, Sony's getting better and better. So I think that as they improve these cameras, they will start, you know, they'll pay attention. I think they will add touch. I sure, I sure hope they do. Yeah. Well, Doug, another one of the things that Sony put a lot of effort into with this camera was the shutter, right? And, yeah. And um, and I know you you've played around with that. So tell us about it. What what's what's special about the shutter? Or what what's good, the bad, the ugly? Yeah. It's it's a. Uh, you know, I read an interview with one of the Sony engineers who had to design this thing, and he said the most difficult thing they had to do in this camera was to put the sh to get the shutter in there because it has a shutter that goes as fast as one eight thousandth of a second. Mm -hmm. Now that's that's sort of the high end for most DSLRs, but to get it into a tiny package like this is quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, now on this camera, it's particularly interesting because this camera has a rear curtain mechanical shutter. What does that mean? There's a lot of talk about this. Yes. So that means when you press the shutter button, the first thing, the shutter is wide open in the beginning because it's mirrorless. You're looking at the viewfinder. You're seeing the image as it um, as it's coming through the sensor into your viewfinder. Yep. So the shutter is open to begin. When you press the button, the camera starts recording the image. At the end of the exposure, it closes a mechanical shutter. And then it reopens it so that you can see once again. Now, yep. in this camera... Um, I don't know why there's not an electronic only shutter. It's a little over my pay grade to understand some of these things. But I want to show you what's interesting about this. I've got this camera right now set for a two second exposure. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you when I press the button and you can hear what happens. All right. On the count of three, I'm going to take a picture. One, two, three. Notice the click happens after two seconds. Mm -hmm. The only click you're hearing, the click is the closing of the shutter at the end of the exposure, not at the beginning. Hmm. Very unusual. Um, at least it's unusual to me. It's not something I'm familiar with. So that's the A7. The A7R has a mechanical shutter at the beginning and the end. And as you know better than I, because I've never had my hands on an A7R, yeah. um, that has a funny sounding click because you basically get these... I don't know. You tell me. Twice. It sounds like what you just demonstrated twice. That's, yeah. what, that's what I hear. And I thought I, you know, when I first started playing with it, again, you know, I had my, my gear lust eyes on. I'm like, okay, let me figure out how to use this thing. This was after I was chimping on it, trying to figure out how to hit the touch screen, and it wasn't working. So when I figured out no touch screen, okay, I'm manipulating the camera, I'm shooting, I'm shooting. Each shutter, acu acu well, I can't say that word, actuation, actu actuation. Each actuation, yeah. Yeah. Each shutter press, shutter press. Um, each time I pressed the shutter, I heard ka clunk, ka clunk, ka clunk, ka clunk. You know, like, is this thing broken? What's going on? You know, what's <laughs> happening? So, you know, I found a Sony person, and I said, listen, ka clunk, ka clunk. Is that right? Do I do I have a beta unit or something? No, nope, that's the way it works. And you know why that? Why what's happening on those two ka clunk, ka clunks, Doug? Right. Well, the sh what's happening is the shutter is in the in the first in the in the front curtain of course what's happening is it's closing and then opening to take the picture yeah and then at the end of the exposure it's closing to stop the picture and then opening back up again so you can see it yeah so you 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 get two shutter actuations with a normal shutter like that but in the case of the sony um, the mechanics of it to squeeze it in. I mean, again let's take a look at this for those of you who are used to an SLR and aren't used to a mirrorless 
Uh, well, maybe you can't really see it here, but you know that that sensor is really close to the mount. It is right. It is. Yeah. Oh, and you can even see. Look, there's there's one of my dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh my awesome. god! <laughs> Reflected in my sensors, my Tyrannosaurus yeah. Rex. Yeah. Um, be, be quiet up there. Don't make any more noise. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so the shutter is a little strange. But the fact is that to be able to have a shutter that goes at an eight thousandth of a second is a big plus because yeah. those of us who want to shoot wide open um, in the daytime. Uh, really can do that because we have that fast shutter. Anyway, that's yeah, just one, yeah. one peculiar. Not not a big deal. It's just something that uh, if you shoot long exposures, will surprise you the first time you do it. Yeah. the the other The other thing about that that shutter, like when you click yours, you could hear it. It's loud. You know, it's very loud. Yeah. I found it very loud, which made me think. Well, if you're a wedding shooter or you're trying to be stealthy doing street photography or something like that, then Especially in the A7R, it's a dead giveaway that you're taking someone's picture. You know, yeah. I mean, on some of these cameras, like the Panasonic GX7, you can go fully electronic on the shutter, and it's in stealth mode. You don't even know when you've taken a picture; it just takes the picture. You know, just records the data with no mechanical sound at all. So that was that was just another thing that I found a little bit disconcerting about the camera. Yeah, I should also mention that it is possible to turn on the front curtain mechanical shutter as well, in which case you get that same double clicking sound that you get from the A7R. What about what about autofocus? So that's that's another big thing that folks need to, you know, it's a it's a it's a, a sticking point of okay, the autofocus needs to be really fast. Is it fast on this camera? I wouldn't say it's really fast. It the autofocus on this camera is better than the Sony NEX line, okay, but not by a lot. I, I don't consider this to be a particularly good autofocus camera. I found the autofocus, I find, since I still own it, uh, I find that it's reasonably easy to fool. You know, the classic error is to get this thing to focus. It focuses on the background by accident instead of sure. the foreground. Yeah. I should point out that the A7R is actually worse in autofocus because the A7R doesn't have the uh, on-sensor phase detection elements. This this has a somewhat improved autofocus compared to the higher end A7R camera. Um, not great, you know, again, not great for things that move fast, uh, but um, I do a lot of manual focus work with this, and we'll, we'll, again, we'll talk about who this is for. Yeah. Uh, you'll see that. So it, it's okay. Auto, I, you know, some of these micro four-thirds, like the, uh, the, the Lumix uh, GX7, I thought is a better autofocusing camera than this Sony. Yeah. Now, are you... So... When you say that it's not the fastest autofocus in the world, does that mean that this both of these bodies, the A7 and the A7R, are non-starters for people that want to shoot sports and wildlife and things that, that can move around fast? I, I think that's probably the case. I think this is not these are not good action cameras. These are uh, more more think about it and then plan it and then shoot it kind of cameras. They're okay for, you know, family shots and all that, but they're also overkill in that sense because they are they are high end cameras, make no yeah. mistake. Yeah, it's like when when I when I spoke with Gordon Lang about this camera, he said that the the A seven R in particular is more of a it's more of a photographer that you a, a camera that the photographer would use for considered shots, right? Yes. So it's not you're not running and gunning and you know going crazy with continuous high. You are it's almost like a, almost like a medium format camera where you're like, okay, I got my shot, I'm ready, ka clunk ka clunk, I got it. <laughs> you know, it should come with a dark cloth you put over your head, you know, ka clunk ka clunk. Right. Although I should say I've been doing a lot of street photography with this camera, and I love it for that as long as you don't have a problem with the shutter noise. So right. the kind of street right. photography do, but uh, a lot of that is manual focus for me. Yeah. Well, speaking of focus, what about lenses? That's another thing because this is a brand new system, right? This is not. This is this is something new, which you can adapt to it, right? If I'm if I'm not mistaken, but there's new lenses coming. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing when Sony came out with this camera because they really only shipped it with. What one lens, I think, really, which was the kit lens. Mm -hmm. The kit lens, I even have to look it up here. Even though I have it, I've never used it, to be honest. Uh, it's a 28 to 70 uh, f3.5 to 5.6 lens. I don't even have it in front of me for some reason. Now, the first, and then they announced a roadmap of lenses, which includes this one, um, but very few lenses. So they've got to deal with Carl Zeiss to design some great lenses. This is a marvelous lens. This is a 35 millimeter f2.8 lens. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, it's very similar to the lens that is on the Sony RX1R. That's an F2. Mm. And I, I believe, as I've been told, that there were some engineering reasons that they couldn't quite fit the F2 stuff into this because this has to have a removable um, mount. So okay. it doesn't have quite that. But um, there are the other lens that just came out, I just got about a week ago, is this one. This is the uh, 55 millimeter f1.8. Uh, I also like it quite a bit. Um, it's not as spectacular as the 35. Both of these are about a thousand bucks a piece, so they're not cheap lenses, by the yeah, way. Yeah. But um, this 55 is real nice. It's bigger than I expected. I mean, it, you can't really tell uh, from my sitting here in my hand, but um, I expect it's somewhat smaller. The 35 is really compact, which I like. Now on the on the A7R. Sony came out with, when they shipped it, they shipped a coupon with the camera. If you bought an A7R, I, I don't know if this is still the case, you got a coupon for an adapter of oh. your choice. And the adapters are, let me show you one here. No, that's, uh, that's good marketing right there. <laughs> so here's an adapter for a, um, a Leica lens. Mm. They said Sony went out and they actually encouraged people to use adapters and go out and get third-party lenses for Nikon, for Canon, uh, for um, Leica. And the reason that they can do this is the secret to the mirrorless camera, which is because the lens is physically so close to the, sh to the sensor that lenses, are design lenses that are designed for bodies that have mirrors can be extended, right? You can, if, if the lens is intended to be a long distance from the sensor, mm -hmm. you can use an adapter to make that spacing correct. That means this is sort of the universal camera. Here's a full frame camera that can accept almost any lens from almost any full frame camera. Which is cool. That's killer. Really cool. Really yeah. cool. So, yeah, but, but the caveat is you lose autofocus. You right? lose, you lose autofocus, you lose anything that the lens would do, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, you just, so, you're getting the light. You can get the light into the sensor and take pictures, but you're in manual mode for or aperture priority or whatever for the most part, right? Exactly. So let's take it. Let's just show how this works for people who haven't done it before. So here's the Sony camera with the 35. You take the 35 off. You put your Leica adapter here on. If you can figure out how to do it. Yeah. Now these adapters, by the way, you can get the cheap ones. There's no reason you can't go out and get the $20 adapters. Don't listen to people who say you need a a uh, hundred dollar or two hundred dollar adapter. There's no glass in these things, right? It's yeah. just a spacer, is all it is. Yeah. And then here's an example of a lens. This is a Voigtlander um, 28 millimeter, 28 millimeter f2 for Leica. Look and, at that. It looks right? like a real camera now. You must be oh, yeah. a good photographer. I must be. I must be because I have one of these, right? <laughs> yeah. But this is this is a beautiful lens. This lens only cost a little over six hundred dollars, but it's you know beautifully sharp f2 lens. And so now I have manual aperture control, right? A real old-fashioned aperture ring. Like, that is like, kind of cool. Like, like a real camera. Yeah. I have uh, manual focus, right, which I'm doing from below here. So the reason that this works so well as a manual focus camera is this focus peaking. So here I'm taking a shot, and I'm showing what the focus peaking is like. And you can see as I focus that things that are in focus turn red. Mm -hmm. And so this is a great, I've got it set to red, you can change the color if you like. But the whole idea of focus peaking is, makes it really a marvelous, marvelous camera for manual focus. Much easier than a Leica where you have the rangefinder kind of viewer and so forth. So I absolutely love this for manual focus. And you can do family shots, you can do pet shots. Um, I, I wouldn't want to shoot the quarterback running straight at me with manual focus. Um, but, you know, you can do sports shots with it too. It you know, if you're good at it, it's faster than autofocus. Yeah, yeah. And I know a lot of photographers say, hey, you're not a real photographer if you don't shoot manual. And, you know, you got to shoot manual and manual focus, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, there's something to be said for it. There really is. Because when you learn to focus manually and you learn to focus manually quickly, I think you do become a better photographer. I think that's part yeah. of it. Yeah, that, that, that's a whole different discussion, I think. But <laughs> I, I think I think that the technology in these cameras are far smarter than we are in a lot of cases. Uh, so you should you should know how to do both. I think. You know, um, now, what are we looking I, at right here, Doug? Yeah, this looks I, like an abomination. I, I had to show you this, right? <laughs> this, in fact, 
You you saw this, this is a family play. show, Doug. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, you got to see this when we had lunch the other day. Yeah. Um, this is an example of what you can do now. This this is again just it's an example. Here is a gorgeous lens that's about forty years old. It's a Leica. It's a one thirty five millimeter f four. It is beautifully sharp. Um, but it is not the current state-of-the-art lens that Leica makes. But because of the age, I was able to get this used for $300. Wow. And I've been shooting with it, and I just love it. But this is an example of how you can, with an adapter, put almost anything on this camera and use it. I've put Nikon primes on it. I haven't done any Canon primes because I don't own it, but Nikon primes and zooms, by the way, and the zooms. So, for example, that marvelous uh, Nikon... Uh, 14 to 24 zoom that everybody loves. It looks yeah. a little stupid on a camera this small, but uh, it works great. It works. Yeah. yeah. See, that's, Not, that's one of the things I wanted to throw out at you um, is, is this camera the bridge for folks that have been sort of poo-pooing mirrorless because of the small sensor sizes and they're saying, hey, I'm going to stick with my DSLR. Is this camera, especially with the adapters, does it represent that, that okay, you have no excuses technology to move into mirrorless and all that mirrorless can offer, like focus peaking and that sort of thing? Absolutely. It is because it is, not only is it the first, as we've said, mirrorless, full-frame, autofocus camera. Interchangeable. Small, interchangeable. Sorry, that too. Yeah. You have, have to remember all the adjectives. Yeah. <laughs> Not only, not only is it that, but it is one of the very best cameras on the market, period. It just happens that it doesn't have a mirror. Right. Um, so this is this is one that will really up your game in, in that sense. Just before you end the lenses discussion, I want to mention that there are two more lenses that are coming out soon. Uh, Sony has a 24 to 70. Um, it's an F4. Mm -hmm. And uh, the old classic, the 70 to 200 which is also an F4. Both of those are coming out, and both of those have in-the-lens image stabilization. So Good. those are the, the so the classic zooms. No wide-angle announced yet, but that mid-range zoom and the telephoto zoomer are coming out in the next few months. So that's a big deal. Um, you can also use a, a Sony adapter, and that will allow you to use lenses from the big alpha cameras like the Alpha 99 mm -hmm. uh, and also get autofocus with those as well. I want to mention one other thing that's really cool about this sure. and that is I tried, I took all my old E-mount lenses for the uh, the NEX series and I tried them out and as you'd guess most of them don't cover the full frame sensor so you have two choices there. You can let this thing automatically switch to crop mode now, if you do that on this camera, what happens is it works perfectly well, and you simply have a 10 megapixel camera instead of a 24 megapixel camera. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's really pretty good. A lot of what I shoot, 10 megapixels, really is just fine. If you happen to have a, um, a an A7R, which is 36 megapixels normally, and you put a crop lens on it, it drops down to 16 megapixels, which is more than adequate for almost everybody, unless you're yeah. doing big work. So yeah. that use case is sort of neat, being able to put the smaller, less expensive lenses on it, let's say for travel or something like that. Very appealing. Yeah. But I did find that one lens, one of my favorite lenses, this is the, um, the, the what is it actually? It's a 10 to 18 millimeters. This is a wide angle zoom. This lens actually does work. Even though it's a crop lens, it actually does work on the a7. Now it covers it covers the whole the whole sensor. It covers the whole thing, not at all focal lengths. Okay. So you've got to go from about 12 and a half millimeters to 16 millimeters, but that's a really nice range in full frame. That's a pretty wide angle. Mm -hmm. So between 12 and a half millimeters and 16 uh, millimeters, you get the use of this beautiful f/4 lens um, that works on the NEX. It also works on the Alpha Sevens. Very cool. Nice. Lots of options there. So, okay, so switching from lenses, video, right? What about video? Yeah, Can, how video, does this thing hold up there? I, I was impressed. The video is really pretty good. Um, I, I'm not a video guy. I should put a little caveat there, so I don't do a lot of testing of video. Uh, but if you look at the specs in particular, it's very good. It's um, 1080p, of course, goes up to uh, 50 or 60 frames a second. It puts out a nice, clean stream of 28 megabits per second. So it's a high bit rate video yeah. through the uh, HDMI output. And they have something strange, which is 
you can you can feed the video to a 4K television if you happen to have a 4K television, uh, but you're still only getting 1080p. You don't really get full 4K video out of this thing, not yet. Hmm. Interesting. And one one of the reasons I again I read one of the engineers' comments. He says that the processor just generated too much heat uh, when they tried to uh, do 4K video with this. Yeah, that's cool. Well, good. Does it does it have an audio out port on there? Or, oh, or audio it. in, yeah, rather. Yeah. What it's got is, yeah, let me show, I won't bother showing you, but it's got an audio in, stereo mic, uh, and it's got a headphone jack. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. See? Oh, by the way, one thing you may not have noticed, let me switch back here. There is no built-in flash. No. Now, that tells you something about this camera. Uh, it tells you who it's for. This is not your point-and-shoot snapshot camera because sure. there's no built-in flash. Um, you can buy an, an, external, an external flash. It has a standard hot shoe. You can put a Sony flash on it. You can also get a Sony continuous light flash slash flash combination for this camera for doing video as well as stills. But the fact that it doesn't have a built-in flash, like I say, makes a bit of a statement already. Yeah, yeah. Now, Doug, just to, just to digress a little bit, when we when we talk about mirrorless, typically the conversation is about APS-C or Micro Four Thirds, and now this guy, right, with full frame. For the folks that are out there and with Micro Four Thirds cameras and that sort of universe ocean of lenses that they can attach to the Micro Four Thirds mount, does this camera offer them anything? I mean, aside from the obvious, the giant sensor, right? So should like you mentioned before, stopping down to 16 megapixels is perfectly adequate for many people, and that's when most of these, like the OMD, the Olympus OMD, the Panasonic GX7, et cetera, et cetera, on the Micro Four Thirds side, that's what they use. Should this camera be tempting them away from the Micro Four Thirds format and into Sony? I don't think so. I mean, if you've made the decision to go to Micro Four Thirds, um, first of all, you've decided that a smaller sensor is okay for your type of photography. So unless you have two different styles of working or shooting, then there's no reason to have both. Yeah. You've also decided that you want small, that small is important to you. Um, you have bodies. This body is actually just about the same size as the OMD uh, EM1. It's a very yeah. small camera. But because it's a full-frame camera, the lenses are as big as a full-frame Nikon or Canon. Or, or let's say they're close to it yeah. Uh, for the same aperture. So, um, and, and then also, everything in Micro Four Thirds is less expensive because it's smaller. Yeah. The gla there's less glass in the lenses. They're more compact. They're less expensive. So yeah. I, I don't think this tempts the Micro Four Thirds people unless they particularly want a full-frame camera. To be honest, most people buying Micro Four Thirds today have come from the full-frame world. Yeah, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, let's move on. So the other piece of it, um, there's, it's got built-in Wi-Fi, right? So, yep. um, so you can use the Sony Play Memories application on your tablet or your smartphone to remotely control the the camera. Is that? Did you test that? Does that work okay? Yeah, it works. Um, uh, the the one thing about the Sony Play Memories app is that it's pretty wimpy. Uh, you have very limited control of the camera, and of course, the worst part is just trying, especially from an iOS device, is trying to connect to it and stay connected. Um, yeah. It does come in handy, particularly for things though like remote. So when you want to do remote control of the camera, you can do things like that. But some of the apps that we have, like on the NEX6, aren't yet updated for the A7, such as the time lapse app. So I, I'm sure that maybe even by the time this is published, that will be available. But that's something I missed was some of the fairly basic built-in apps that you can download into the camera. That's yeah. not, not the Play Memories apps per se, because those are downloadable, but they're not ready yet. Yeah, I just like that. Personally, I just like the idea of being able to download functionality into your camera. I mean, it's just that's insanely cool to be able to do that. Yeah, um, absolutely. What about, um, so this camera is still fairly new, and Adobe is pretty aggressive about making sure they support cameras that come out of the gate in Lightroom, etc. Is this, we were, we're recording this, what is it, December 27th, 2013. Is, uh, is Light, Lightroom support this guy yet? Lightroom uh, added support for the RAW files in version 5.3, which is at this point about two weeks old. Uh, what they haven't done is they haven't yet supported tethering, but my experience is that tethering for a given model usually comes about one version of Lightroom later and I look forward to that because this these are 
good cameras to shoot in the studio. Got it. Got it. Cool. All right. So yeah, so far not many, not many negatives. So let's let's jump into that. What's what are the cons? So it sounds like so I know it's gonna be hard for you, Doug. I mean, because you're a fanboy and you're an owner, so you have a little bit of Stockholm syndrome going on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so, being, I'm being held hostage by my cameras, right? <laughs> you are. You are. You you suddenly love your captor. So tell me, tell me uh, what the negatives that you found. Well, the first one is. There's no touch sensitive screen. What's right. up with that? Yeah, what's I, up with that? You know, I, th that's, you know, they need to just fix that because l maybe it's just for people who review cameras and go from one to the other all the time. But once you've had a touch sensitive screen, it's hard to go back and you keep trying to make the damn thing work. I, 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 I think it goes further than that. I mean, we're in a touch world now. I mean, you know, everyone has, most there. people, most people have smartphones, right? And we're trained like monkeys to touch things, you know, <laughs> even some laptops are coming out with touch screens on them. So, you know, it's a touch, it's a touch world and a small device with a screen on it screams touch me. It does. <laughs> Come on. I don't know. Maybe oh, I'm crazy. You're, you're opening up so many things I'm not going to get into. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's one. The other is, another is, where's the manual? You get you can get a, a PDF that says almost nothing about the camera. There is still a lot about the camera that I haven't been able to explore because there's no documentation. And I yeah. I got to assume that there's a real manual for this thing coming. There's you know the manual that they have is like here's how to take a picture, here's how to look at a picture, things like that. Yeah. Um, there's no flash. That's a con for some people. I never use an on-camera flash anyway, so that doesn't bother me. Right. Um, the controls on the camera are really pretty good, but having used the Fuji cameras, you know, like the uh, XE1, the XE2, the X100S, I miss having real controls. I love having an aperture control. Well, this has aperture, but I miss having a shutter dial. Um, this has, like most cameras today, you know, knobs that you program to control aperture and shutter and things like that. But I, yeah. I really wish that. Um, it had full controls. Yeah. I wish it had in-body stabilization. Um, I yeah. gotta believe that's coming in a future version, uh, especially when you're shooting with these primes. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit, but um, you gotta have that. That seems like another one of those must-haves now. Um, yeah. On, the, on this, like the Olympus cameras just yeah. blew that out of the water. It's amazing. On this, the, the problem in this camera is that sensor is so big and they kept the body so small. I don't think there's anywhere near the room for it because that takes space to put, you know, sensor right. stabilization in. Yeah, so, to stabilize that giant sensor in there versus a little yeah. micro four third sensor. Yeah, you know, along with all the shutter problems. So, you know, I'm not going to criticize the camera, but certainly there are times when you wish you had that in body stabilization. Yeah. And uh, another thing that I should mention is that there's still quite a lack of third party accessories for this camera. For example. I wanted to do some uh, uh, long exposure work. Again, there was there was no way for me to really do that. The the type of USB connector they have here isn't supported by any of the third party products. You mean um, for a shutter release? You mean yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it. So I think I can buy a Sony thing for a lot of money, but there's quite a lack of third party products that are going with this. You know, one of the things we don't talk about much is. That if you buy a, you know, a Nikon or a Canon DSLR, there are you know decades of uh, products that have come out to support these things. Yeah, and the ecosystem. These, yeah, it, yeah, very good word for it. There, this the these new cameras don't have the ecosystem, and Sony, being the newest kid on the block, probably has the weakest ecosystem of all. Right. And then the last thing, of course, is the lens selection. It's meager. Um, if you want to dive into the world of other brand lenses and manual focus, you'll be very happy with this camera. Uh, but um, uh, if you want, you know, native lenses with good autofocus and image stabilization, you're going to have to wait for some time. Yeah. One one thing I should mention, we didn't mention on the lenses, very very important. If you do start to get into using Leica and other third party lenses, pay particular attention to problems with wide angle lenses. When you get wider than about 28 millimeter, uh, there are some real problems with the corners. You start to get into what we call color shift. You get sort of magenta. You get streaking in the colors. You get oh. soft focus in the colors. Uh, the best thing to do is just scour all online reviews. Lots and lots of people have been reviewing specific lenses 
for use with these cameras, but when you get wider than 28 millimeter, be very careful with the third-party lenses that you purchase and make sure that somebody else has checked them out first. Yeah, and one thing before we leave this section, Doug, you, you started with the, one of the cons being no flash, um, and you know, and and also saying that this the fact that it has no flash is an indication of who the camera's for. I I don't necessarily like with the Olympus OMD EM5. You don't there, there's no flash on that camera either. But I kind of wish it had a small flash on that, not for you know maybe for occasional fill flash or something, but more so to trigger other off-camera flashes without having to use a pocket wizard or something like that. It's nice, like on the Panasonic GX7, it has a little pop-up flash, which is frankly it's too tiny to do anything, but it can trigger a bunch of other lights to give you more options, just kind of built in. So another reason, you know, to keep your kit small, or another way to keep your kit small is with that little pop-up flash, you can, you know, eliminate a pocket wizard or eliminate the necessity to run a sync cord and that kind of thing. Just, yeah. just want to throw in, that in, in there. In this case, you know, if you look online at the engineering drawings for this camera, mm -hmm. see, there isn't a millimeter of space for them to add anything like that. Yeah. So yeah. their, their trade-off is, do they put in a little teeny pop-up flash or do they make, you know, and make the camera bigger? That's right. that's the issue. And yeah. I personally appreciate the choices they made on this camera. I think they've got all that stuff pretty much right. Yeah. Well, they could they could do something like this, you know, not to play Sony engineer, but this is the old Canon G9 and it's got a built-in flash right there. I don't know if you can see that. See that on the front? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and it's not a pop-up, it's just a flash, you know. And that would right. that would be awesome for for just control, but anyway, right. you know, armchair yeah, but, quarterback. But just, just, <laughs> just to show you, right? This is the corner where you want that to go. <laughs> Get right? rid of that logo. You don't need the yeah, logo. <laughs> but that that little strobe thing that you had will not fit in this space. Yeah, it, it, you're it right. ain't gonna go there. So, you're right. You know, that's you're that's right. what they did. So. All right. So those are the negatives. What are what are the biggest things? I know there's a lot to love a lot to love about this camera. What are the biggest things that you uh, that have your heart? Well, as we've said from the top of the show, this is the smallest interchangeable lens, mirrorless, full frame, and some other adjective. Did we get them all? Uh, yeah. <laughs> camera. And that alone is a lot to be said for it. Uh, the image quality is spectacular, both in the A7 and in the A7R, which is even more incredible. Um, uh, the electronic viewfinder is, to me, the best I've used. Mm -hmm. Um and, um, oh, here's a little one. Gordon Lang mentioned this in one of his reviews, which I really appreciated. You can, it's one of the few cameras where you, where you have the option of charging the battery in the camera via the USB connector, which, if mm -hmm. you're traveling, is sort of handy. For me, I can take an extra battery or two, so it's not a problem, but it's sort of nice. Anyway, uh, it's a joy to use. It's small. It takes great pictures. I don't know what else to say. Are there, are there third-party batteries available for this thing? Because you know. There are third-party batteries. In fact, uh, right now, if you go to uh, eBay, you can get more than $200 off on this camera and get a third-party battery and a 32-gig SD card and a camera case. Nice. Uh, so they exist. Um, I don't use third-party batteries. I know that discussions uh, – <laughs> that, that, that just I came do. up on a, on a recent <laughs> trip, yeah. I, uh, I've had bad luck with them personally, but that's – you know, if, you know, if you buy enough of anything, you're okay. Now, are you with with the battery life of this camera? How how is it? Is it acceptable since you've been using it for quite a while? It's okay. Uh, you know, these are not the teeny batteries that you get in Micro Four Thirds cameras. Yeah, uh, they're not the small batteries that you have in the NEX cameras. Uh, well, actually, they are. No, they're the same as the NX camera. I'm sorry, but it's they're they're you know decent sized batteries. But I carry two spares. I carry three batteries with me wherever same, I go. Same here. Yep. Yeah. Same here. Yep. Yeah. Can't go wrong. Three batteries is the way to go. One in the yeah. camera, two on standby. So. And that's and that's because you probably forgot to charge one of them. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Yeah. That's what'll get you. Oh, I got three batteries, and you have three discharged bricks there. Yeah. Cool. All right. So let's wrap this up. Competition-wise, who's the uh, who? Who is this camera positioned against? Who's it? Yeah. Who's, whose lunch is it trying to eat? <laughs> I had a tough one. You know, what we didn't mention is eating Leica's lunch. That's not even on my list. But this is, you know, to 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 those people who can spend six or seven thousand dollars on a camera, and that does not include me. Um, you know, this is a Leica killer because this is essentially all the quality of a Leica. Oh God, they're gonna hate me for saying that. Um, in, <laughs> in a camera, of blogarithms. Yeah. <laughs> 
a camera that costs a fraction of the amount and uses all those Leica lenses. So it certainly is going to eat some of Leica's lunch. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in more traditional cameras, you know, uh, does it compete with the Nikon D610? Uh, the D610 costs more. Um, it's got the same size sensor as the A7. Yeah. Um, maybe in the Canon line, wow, the Canon 5D Mark III is $2,900 mm. for roughly the same size sensor. The 60, the Canon 60 is cheaper, uh, but, um, you know, 20 megapixel camera, 60, maybe. Um, I don't know that there's any real competition for this except maybe the Nikon D610. I think that's the, the other one that I would look at here, although... You know, 610 is a much bigger camera. I have a 610 around here somewhere. I should have brought it to show you the difference in size. 610 is a pretty good camera. Yeah. Um, the A7R, on the other hand, remember, this is the 36 megapixel camera that does not have the anti-aliasing mm -hmm. um, uh, low-pass filter on it. This is really going right after the Nikon D800E, which is the high-resolution 36 megapixel Nikon. And that camera, I have an 800E, that is a tripod camera. And this goes back to what Gordon Lang said in your interview with him, mm -hmm. which is, these are serious cameras. And if you don't use them well, you're going to be disappointed because you're going to see all the mistakes you made. Yeah. With, the eight, with the 800E, for example, um, if it's not on a tripod, if that tripod isn't solid, uh, the vibration that you get just from the mirror in the 800E will cause you to get a blurry image. Even in the D, uh, in the uh, A7R, even though it's smaller, you get the similar problem. So you have to use these cameras carefully if you want to take full advantage of what they can do. But uh, at at a cam, this camera, sorry, the A7R is a thousand dollars cheaper than the D800E, and takes pictures that are every bit as good. Yeah. So then, the I think you answered the question I was going to throw out there. There's a hypothetical person that is wanting to be a photographer they've got they've got say three four thousand dollars to to dump into this new hobby that they're considering but they're hamstrung because they keep hearing about all these different cameras mirrorless and then nikon with and canon and all these different things what should they buy doug should should that person that doesn't have an investment in lenses right now and they're just getting into photography should they just go straight for the A7R or the A7 and jump in that way, or should they go more the traditional route with the, one of the Canons or the Nikons? You know, I, I should have thought about this before we started the show. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know I was going to ask that, did you? <laughs> well, I knew because we always do this, but, you know, <laughs> having gone over this, I, I love this camera, but I've been shooting for a long time. Uh, I don't think this is a good place to get started in photography. I think you're much, I mean, if you want the benefits, which are the small camera, the high quality, I would probably start with either Micro Four Thirds, that's the Olympus or Panasonic Lumix, mm -hmm. or I would start with the Fujis, mm. um, I think, yeah. you know, which is a, a medium-sized sensor. I think right. those are much better places for most people. Yeah. This and is, it depends on what they're shooting, too. If they're, if they're wanting yes. to get into fashion or sports or whatever, then that's going to affect the decision, right? Right. If you're brand new to photography and you know you want to shoot you know, murals that are six feet across of landscapes and you're going to shoot on a tripod and focus manually, then sure, dive into the A7R and go that route. Yeah. But I think uh, I think to really appreciate what this camera can do requires a certain amount of experience and, to be honest, a certain amount of skill. And I don't know that this is a great place to start your photographic uh, life. Um, do, you, do you think the A7R is the ideal Trey Radcliffe HDR camera? Uh, it is for Trey Ratcliffe. <laughs> yeah, for Trey you know, Ratcliffe, yeah. You know, I mean, look, Trey, Trey knows how to use the camera, so he's oh, going to yeah. take full full advantage of it, and he does, and he's using Leica lenses on it. You know, he's got some very expensive lenses now that he has access to. So, um, great for that. I may get an A7R yet because they're getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. They're, you know, as I said, it's already on sale for $200 off or so. Mm. Um and uh, so that brings the A7R down to just a touch over two thousand dollars. By the time the show is out, that camera might be nineteen ninety nine or something like that. And yeah. you know, at this point, you can't afford not to have one. 
Right. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen to see that's your Stockholm syndrome kicking in. <laughs> well, what I, the thing is that I would I would go out and I would sell my D eight hundred E. I would just uh-huh. go. I would go almost. I would almost dump all my Nikon gear to go this route. Um, wow. You know where where it's going? Who knows? Um, I think it's a great camera for people who can appreciate it. I think you need to be willing to. You know, it is for serious users. Remember, yeah. Yeah. the primes do not have image stabilization. Okay, so okay. you know, image stabilization is a great crutch. Uh, it allows you to shoot in lower light. It allows you to shoot. Uh, if you're not as steady, it allows you to shoot handheld where you might otherwise need a uh, a tripod. But yeah. it doesn't have a flash. Uh, I would also emphasize prime lenses here. You know, if you're going to get a big 70 to 200 lens, the advantage of having a small body is not as significant. Yeah. But if you're going to get a lens that's like one of these 35 millimeter primes, you know, that we looked at here, if you're going to get a lens that's this small and shoot with it all day long, then this is a great camera because you really get advantage of the smaller size. So sure. Sure. that's a, and um, so emphasize the primes. Remember, no stabilization there, and always carry two batteries spare, two spare batteries. Gotta have it. Gotta have the uh, the spare tire in the trunk, right? Yep. Yep. Cool. Well, I think we nailed it, Doug. I think. Uh... Yeah, I think this is this has been one of the more informative, well-rounded reviews. Even though you are a self-admitted fanboy, you know it's been a well-rounded review on the Sony A7. You know, yeah. Ho- hopefully, people will cut us some slack on that. We we both have used the camera. I happen to have actually purchased them, and um, I, yeah, I, I we, think it's doing funny. Some great I, stuff. I think this was a great review because we went in opposite directions. So I played with it for a week, and I don't have one. I still, I'm still shooting primarily with the with Micro Four Thirds and the Panasonic Lumix GX7. Um, you have a Nikon D800, and now you have a 7 and I'm assuming you're primarily shooting with the A7 now. Is that correct? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But so. before we go, I would yeah. just, I'll, I'll just ask you, just because Uh-oh. I'm trying to mess you up here. You bring it. What What do you think? I mean, would you? Who would you recommend this camera for? I think it's worth taking an extra minute to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, I would. After playing with it, I would recommend this camera. And this this goes along to what I was asking you earlier about the the DSLR user who was making lamenting the fact that there's no full frame mirrorless camera, and that's what was stopping them from moving to mirrorless. I would say, well, and I'll I'll crouch this and all. Don't. In, in under the umbrella of don't upgrade or side grade just for the sake of side grading. If you're shooting and you're getting great shots with what you have right now, stick with it. You know, there's unless there's something significant about having different gear that's going to let you do your art better, you don't necessarily need to upgrade just because everyone is you know raving about these new bodies. So that said, if you are that person that says, okay. I have this older DSLR, and I'm look. I'm hearing all this buzz about mirrorless and all that. It's time for me to to move. This sounds like the ideal camera for that person. Now, me personally, I'm in this sort of mindset of less is more, downsizing. You know, cleaning out my closet, my garage. I want I want to get in the car and go shoot, and not worry about bringing the giant bags of back-breaking gear with me. So I'm more of a Micro Four Thirds shooter right now. So this camera doesn't necessarily fit for me. But if you're moving down from a DSLR or moving over from a DSLR, then this seems like the ideal with some caveats like the you know the lack of in-body image stabilization and the lack of uh, touchscreen. So with those caveats notwithstanding, it seems like an ideal choice for that DSLR migration person. Yep. I couldn't yeah. agree more. Excellent. Cool. Cool. All right, Doug. So we're at the end of the show. Where, uh, where, where are we taking this thing next? What's next yeah. for, for all gonna, about the gear? I, I'm the next one. I'm hoping to look at is the Olympus OMD EM1. I hope to get <sighs> that in my hands in the next few weeks. You're killing uh, me with that. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, we've got a couple of other special shows. Not just new. You know, we're taking a break. You know, this fall, the fall of 2013 was had quite a few new camera announcements. Oh yeah. Uh, you were in New York for Photo Expo. Yeah. And um, quite a lot of good stuff, especially in the smaller camera world. So uh, we'll be catching up with a little bit of those announcements. Uh, but you know, Sony, Fuji, Olympus, even Panasonic, they're all coming out with new stuff even in January. So uh, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna have a busy 2014. 
It's going to be a busy and exciting 2014, and we've got some some interesting changes planned for all about the gear too. So, Ooh. It should be uh, you know, I can't we can't talk about it, Doug. We talked about <laughs> it. We strategized at lunch at T Rex in Berkeley, right. right? So that's where that's where all the big businesses are formed, right? That's so, right. So cool, Doug. This is must, this is must, awesome. must be the mojitos. Must be the mojitos. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. All right. Well, thank you. This has been a, a excellent episode of All About the Gear. Thanks to Doug Kay and his excellent sort of deep dive into these cameras. I guess that's it. Thanks, Doug. All right. Thank you, Fred. Talk to All you right. next time. See you later. Bye-bye.